Rogers TV. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit Rogers.com for more details. A program connecting home, community, and health care. My name is Carol Merton, and today I am delighted to have two, not just one, but two dietitians from Grey Bruce Public Health who are here to talk to us about nutrition, good nutrition, and uh, what it means to be a dietitian. So I want to welcome both Catherine Forsythe and Laura Needham to the program today. Thank you so much for being here with me. Great. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. I want to thank you for your questions about the dietitian role. So I'm just going to start there and, and, you know, I can sip tea while you guys just pass it back and forth. So however we want this to flow, just go right ahead. But first of all, you're both registered dietitians, correct? Yeah, that is correct. So, so what does that mean? Like, how do you get to be a dietitian and who do you register with? Um, I'll start, and Laura, you can fill in where, wherever I uh, maybe don't make something clear. But um, I know a lot of people don't pay attention to that little RD behind dietitian's name, but it is really important because it means that we are a regulated health profession, and that is a college. So we have the College of Dietitians of Ontario that govern our work, our standards of practice, ethics, and conduct. And uh, if you don't see that little RD, um, anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. There is no legal governance around that title. So it gets a little tricky, but uh, to become a registered dietitian, uh, we have to do an undergraduate degree at an accredited university and then apply for an internship or a master's program. So it's beyond your undergrad. I did mine out of uh, Brescia at Western, and uh, I'll let Laura talk about hers. Um, but after that, um, then you apply for internships. And again, don't always get in the first time around. Um, of only about 25 to 30% get placed in an internship. So it, it's not a straightforward thing. Um, and then well, if you complete your internship, that's sort of a nine-month uh time and that's doing placements in all different healthcare settings uh, so to see where your fit is which which sector you like best to work in and um and, and or the option of a master's uh so it's a little more than just that undergrad but laura i know you you went to a different school i did i went to the university of guelph and then i did my placements with my internship up in northern ontario and did a master's of public health up in lakehead Excellent. Excellent. Oh, yeah. So tell me about the role of a dietitian um, in public health and how is it different or is it different from other uh, places you might work as a dietitian? Um, well, I, I could say because I've worked in clinical nutrition as well, so that after after you've completed your internship or your master's, then you have to write the entrance exam with the College of Dietitians of Ontario to become registered. So that's your sort of last official hurdle. Um, and then people can work in many different sectors. So the Starting out in clinical nutrition, that's sort of that hospital setting that, you know, probably most people have been connected to a dietitian through a setting like that. Um, so it's very patient focused, individual focused, and there is an issue that you're trying to help patients with manage symptoms or control symptoms um, and improve their quality of life. So that's a very focused direction. Um, we see dietitians working in family health team settings, community uh, health um, centers. And then Laura was uh, sort of an interesting graduate because she went more right into that public health world. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Laura now. To yeah, talk about that. yeah. So the public health world deals more with the population level. So we're not usually looking at individual people. We're looking at entire communities. Um, and how we can support their health by either the, changing their environment or changing policies, building healthy public policies. Um, and so it's a little bit of a different approach, but what, whatever setting we're in, whether it's long-term care, primary care, public health, um, dietitians are considered to be the experts in our health system when it comes to food and health and how they, how they work together. 
So how, how many years are we talking until you get to the point where you're actually a practicing, officially registered dietitian? And it sounds like a, a while. <laughs> um, it's generally about five years. So the four-year undergrad and then the the that fifth year is the practical placement. So um, but yeah. some of some people won't get there directly. Like Catherine was saying, very few uh, undergrads get directly into a placement. Um, so they may go and do a master's in between or have some time working in the in the field uh, or in a related field before they get the chance to actually complete that and have the chance to write their registration exam. Excellent. So you're both in public health, which means you're you're looking at population health. But I'm sure you both see trends and how things change over time. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in, in the world of nutrition and how it affects health? I think right now what I'm seeing a lot of is how people are changing their relationships with food so and their bodies themselves. So what we are trying to promote a healthier relationship with food instead of looking at food as something we need to use as a tool to control our bodies and and our health. It's it's something that we do have a relationship with and it does impact our social well-being and our our health in other ways other than the nutrients themselves. Um, so I think that's a shift in how dietitians are practicing out there and hopefully it's being communicated out to the population more broadly. Um, do you want to add to that? I, would, I would say that that mental health component, that making the connection between mood and food is how be, most people put it, um, that it is really one of the pillars of supporting your mental health, that you need to, to be able to access affordable, culturally appropriate food for yourself and your family. And that's becoming a, more and more of a challenge for people. So um, the, the recognition and, and acknowledgement of the challenges there and that's part of public health work then is to try to address those systemic issues that are being barriers for people. You mentioned about the mental health, but there's a huge social component all around food. And we certainly saw that in COVID when people weren't able to socialize and enjoy gatherings together. Um, and the other is, as we grow in our diversity, I'm amazed to see what's in the grocery shelves around food offerings, which are expand our knowledge of food and nutrition, and I think is a is an important thing as well for our communities. What do you see at your end when you're doing population health and our population diversity changes? There's certainly a demand for more um, variety in our food and seeing our own cultures being reflected in our food system. So I think that's a really exciting thing. And I think the pandemic also showed us that um, people were interested in food when they had a time to make sourdough bread. They wanted to try making sourdough bread. They wanted that connection to food, but because now that we're getting back out of it, um, people don't have that same time. They don't have the resources available to actually commit to just doing food. Um, so I think it's a really interesting thing that there is still that desire for connection, but not necessarily the ability to, to do it. Right. So there is one question that I'm going to write the answer down to because I didn't have the answer. What is one food or nutrition related book or movie or series that you would encourage the public to watch or read. And I'm wondering if you both have the same or if you both have different ones. So you each get a chance for this one. Yeah, you go ahead, Laura. No. Okay, I I, I like Forage, um, which features Chef Sean Adler and it's on the CBC. You can find it online, um, but it's, it's all about what we have in our natural food systems. So actually foraging for foods and chef um, Sean Adler is a local chef. So he, he was, he's teaching about these foods that we actually have in our backyard here. He has a restaurant out of Flesherton. So I think it's a really exciting one. If you're kind of interested in seeing being a little bit more connected to the land and waters and what we actually have here that maybe we've lost sight of with our, our, 
um, conventional food system. Yeah, Catherine. Um, just on the piggyback of that, another chef, Zach Kijig, is also leading foraging tours, um, and his new restaurant is taking shape downtown Owen Sound. So we are really lucky to have um, knowledge keepers and uh, chefs that are bringing that Indigenous knowledge and connection back to land um, all together. Um, the two, two things that came to mind, though, when you said that, one would be braiding sweetgrass, which is a book by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And it is a, it's a love letter to the land. It just shows how connected we are to all creation, um, land, animals, water, air. You, it, it's beautiful. You won't put it down if you start reading it. And then something that's come out more recently is Lessons in Chemistry. And that is a book as well, which I loved reading the book, but the series is not so bad and it's on Apple TV plus. So there is, you need a subscription for that, I guess, but um, they've done a nice job of capturing some of the essence. And it's, it's basically a woman scientist who was not being respected as a woman scientist back in the fifties, who then is encouraged to do a cooking show. So she brings all her science chemistry knowledge to that cooking show and it's brilliant. Fun. Well, I wrote them all down, so thank you. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't know where to even look or what to what to look for. So they sound great. So thank you. So another one of your questions that you you have given to me, and we we know that there are people who have some challenges, um, who don't have access to perhaps physicians or nurse practitioners, or who who need access to a dietitian but can't get a direct referral. So how could the public access a dietitian if you don't have one where you would normally go or if you don't have the access to referral? How do they, how do they get help? We have a few options. There are private practice dietitians that you can access. And if you're having trouble finding them, um, you can give a call to public health and we can help you help give you some contacts that may work out for you. Um, there's also uh, health 811, which is kind of replacing uh, telehealth, but you can call or do a virtual chat with a dietitian through that service as well. They can answer some kind of general questions, um, give you advice about different foods and any nutrition questions you may have. Um, and then if you want to just look for information from a trusted source, unlockfood.ca um, is a website built by dietitians. So all of the information on there has been written by a dietitian. And that one I have looked at and it's great. It's yeah. you know, for sure. Yeah. No, it's that's consumer uh, friendly. That's... Yeah. Well, that's what I need. I'm a consumer, right? <laughs> I need it to be friendly. So yeah, I found it really engaging and, and that, that was good. So I want to chat a bit about nutrition month because we're, that's March, right? And we're taping towards the end of March. So this program may run in April, but Nutrition and good nutrition is year-round for people. What would you like to comment about Nutrition Month and your messaging that you want to say and how those messages stick through the other 11 months of a year? Well, that, that's just it, right? People don't stop eating at the end of March. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, this is it's nice to have a designated time to celebrate. And this year's theme was actually We Are Dietitians, um, bringing it right back home and celebrating the diverse group uh, that is available. You know, we have more than 40 dietitians operating in Gray and Bruce, um, but anywhere from home care settings to private dietitians. So either through OHIP funded services, many of your family health teams will have dietitians on staff, but many of the rostered patients don't even know that yet. So ask around, make sure uh, you, you make the connections you can. Um, but as Laura was saying, there are some places to reach out if you don't have direct access. Um, but I think that's the point is, you know, we, we do go to school for quite some time to become the experts in this field. And we, we like to share our knowledge and we want people to tap into that. So to, to know that we're out there and available, um, I know it, it, our whole healthcare system is, is challenging at times these days uh, for people, but, you know, try, to, try all the avenues and uh, hopefully you'll be able to find some of the information you need. And that takes us on to the topic of food insecurity, um, because dietitians, if, if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, 
your goal is to keep people healthy through all of those ages and stages of life. And you want to help people before they really, really need to have that help, right? To, in other words, help, help us stay healthy. But we have, from what I understand from your media release, um, we have an, a public health issue, a serious public health issue about it, food insecurity. So not that I want to you know, end the last half of our program on a negative, but I think it's really important to be able to talk about this. Um, one of the things that I read that just hit me right between the eyes, almost one in five Grey Bruce households struggles to purchase the food they need and are food insecure. That's a high number. So I'm going to turn it over to both of you to take the topic and discuss food insecurity and your thoughts as dietitians around how we can address this very serious problem. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go first? I'll start off. So like you said, food insecurity is when a household can't purchase the food that they need. They don't have enough money for the food that they need. Um, so quite often what we see as the response to that in our communities is something food-based. People think, okay, we'll just give someone food. Seems like it might solve the problem, but they're kind of not realizing that food insecurity isn't about malnutrition. So it can't be solved with food. It's it's the health impacts occur because we can't afford the food and it's creating this toxic stress in our lives. Um, and if you are always thinking about that, that, you know that if you can't afford food, it'd be hard to concentrate on anything else in that moment, right? Um, and like you said, nearly one in five uh, households in Grey Bruce are food insecure, but one in four children are food food insecure. So you do see younger age groups being even at higher risk of that. And the health impacts of that can last through their life. So they'd be experiencing things like depression and anxiety. They're not able to learn um, as well when they're in schools. And that carries through um, as they get into adulthood, those mental health concerns continue. And then they, they're also at high risk of things like chronic disease and infectious disease and increased mortality. So it's a very serious issue that quite often doesn't get addressed the way it should be. Because what we actually need is to improve the financial circumstances of households. Catherine, what would you comment? What else can we, we add to this whole issue? It, it's a really complex topic, and so it's hard to wrap it all up. Um, I think the things to remember are there's a lot of great people working in that emergency food response system and community meal programming in our area, and we are so fortunate to have all those dedicated volunteers and paid individuals who work in that sector, um, and they are filling an, an immediate need. Um, because even though food isn't going to solve food insecurity, we still know people need to eat. So they create a nice social setting for people to come and, and gather around. But along with that, we need those solutions, those longer term sustainable solutions that will be able to address those financial insecurities and, and provide households with the adequate income so they can pay to keep food on the table and a roof over their head. So it's, it's got a lot of layers um, and, and we need all those layers working together and it's going to take municipal, provincial, federal, you know, all levels of government to look at this and, and humans to, to continue to share what they have, um, include people in all their food related issues. You think about that food traditionally was used to bring people together and sadly now it's sort of a divisive thing and we've feel like we've widgetized food a little bit, turn it into a commodity that's made for profit. And somehow we have to turn that around a little to say, you know, it is a human right and we need to make sure everyone has affordable access to it. We've noticed over the, the last little while um, that with rising costs, as you mentioned earlier, and, and just, you know, sometimes people have to start making choices about paying their rent and putting food on the table. And we hear those stories, unfortunately. We hear the stories of the increased demand um, because like you say, people have to eat. Um, we hear stories of people who are working two jobs but still have to require um, going to those interim solutions uh, and thank goodness they're there, but they're not the ultimate 
solution. Um, and it is a concern for our community. As public health dietitians, you've mentioned some of the health concerns. So people who are on lower income or, you know, they're, they're doing their best, but they just can't make it ends meet. And, and it's not even just lower income. Now it's more into the middle income and it's seniors on fixed income. Like it's not, uh, it's a wide spectrum. How can people stay healthy recognizing that every every little bit is being stretched? What would your advice to people be to, to help them stay he healthy in times of, of this financial pressure? There's lots big of different question. strategies that we can use for that. That's a big question. Um, and it does depend on what their resources are in their household, right? So, I mean, if we have... Um, if we, if we have the ability to cook together, if we're a small household, you can kind of stretch your budget by combining household budgets a bit and cooking with other people. Um, that lets you take advantage of the bulk prices that we tend to see uh, more often. Um, but it's, it is important to remember that, like you said, a lot of households that are food insecure, they're, they're working full-time jobs, multiple jobs. Uh, so it's not really a matter of budgeting or it, there's just not enough money. Um, I know we have our nutritious food basket results on food affordability that are showing that um, our social assistance isn't keeping up with the cost of living. So for a single person on Ontario Works right now, they have to spend their entire budget on housing alone, and it's not even enough at that. They have no money left over for food. You can't budget your way out of that. Um, that's something that we need to change that system to make it so that we actually are recognizing, yeah, people need housing, they need food, and we need to make sure that if we have a program that says it's providing that basic quality of life, that it's doing that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thought, yeah, I know. We, the other thought that I, I want to throw in here, though, is is that food literacy, and that's the term we use for eleven different interconnected attributes around food. Most people think food literacy means I know how to cook, but it's much more than that. It's having the resources, the time, the energy, the confidence to be able to put a meal together. And if you can purchase plain raw ingredients, which what that nutritious food basket costs is just the plainest, no processed food, um, you know, it, you can create lower cost meals, but you have to have a safe space to do that, store and prep your food and the skills to be able to put it together in a, in a meal. So I think food literacy is part of the answer and I think our school system can be a big piece of this um, and any kind of programming that is done in the community if it can be around how to improve people's attitudes and confidence and ability to work with food I think of that book something from nothing and you know you ask anyone who is on a limited budget they can stretch food farther than Laura or I know how you know after all our years of schooling because that's not what they teach in in nutrition school that's a real life issue that I think we need to we need to focus back on preparing children with that skill set and you know, I'm old enough to know that there were, you know, I, I had home ec in my grade seven and eight days. And I feel, I know we probably can't go right back to that, but somehow we've got to work more food skills and food literacy learning in younger years. And then beyond food, we also need to look to income again and what income supports exist in our community. If we can improve the financial circumstances of a household, make sure that they're accessing all their income tax benefits. If you need a uh, to a free income tax clinic. I know there's they're up and running for this year, so definitely take advantage of those um, because there's a lot of credits that go un, unclaimed. And the, every little bit helps. And uh, the, the tax clinics, um, for sure, people may not even realize that they could qualify for, for some of the, the benefits, for sure. It was interesting in the news release that, that I also noted and you hadn't mentioned, but you, you go out and you collect data. You actually go and so tell me a little bit. It says public health dietitians collected data on the lowest cost of 61 food items in 12 grocery stores across Grey Bruce. And I didn't know that you went out and about and did that sleuth work. <laughs> yeah, so that's that nutritious food basket survey. We kind of quickly 
talked about it, but um, it lets us know how much it costs to buy food in our area. And then we use that data to compare it to local incomes and what we expect people to be able to bring into their households, as well as the cost of rent, and can say, okay, is food affordable? That's how we know what, whether or not we're managing to make food affordable in our area. And it's not necessarily a problem of prices of food going up all the time um, if incomes are also going up, right? So it, it's that relationship between incomes and expenses that really matters and will make someone either keep someone protected from food insecurity or, or not. Yeah, and also using, using nutritious foods. Sometimes busy lifestyles lead to uh, perhaps choosing things that maybe aren't as nutritious um, and maybe more expensive as well. Um, Catherine, yeah, and our nutritious food basket doesn't have any of that food in it. It's very much a basic, basic diet. It does assume people have the skills, the kitchen, all, everything they need to actually purchase and use those basic foods. So we have a couple of minutes left in the program. It always flies fast when I'm talking about food and uh, talking with public health. Where can people go to sign up for the food basket? Like if people who are listening or might be interested, do you know, or should they just dial 211 and find out where there, there are options to so there is a good food box locally, but the nutritious food basket isn't something that someone can purchase. It's it's like a survey tool. So it's just okay. a list of food items that we write the price down for, essentially. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 So there, but there are lots of different programs. If um, if someone is interested in either finding income supports or food supports in the community, I definitely encourage them to call two one one or visit their website. Um, mm -hmm. Our area does a really good job. All the organizations and service providers keep those listings quite up to date. Uh, so if there's something in our community, there's a good chance you'll be able to find it through there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if you want to do something about this issue, I'd encourage you to get in touch with our local political leaders, because that's at the end of the day, what we need to see is some, some targets and policies that are aiming to improve food insecurity. I think certainly addressing the needs of the children, for sure, with the nutrition is really, really important. So we have a minute left. Who'd like the last word? Or you both can share it. <laughs> Well, I'll just say that whatever, you know, if you're someone who is uh, good at cooking, have those skills, please share them. Um, don't keep them to yourself. Um, volunteer with the programs um, and make sure any food that you're offering in your settings, whether it's a program, school, community, um, are, are being good examples. Um, we call them food guide friendly foods, um, that things that are going to give you the nutrition that you need to grow, maintain your own health physically and mentally. I want to thank both of you. And I've got a list of things to look up now. As a result, I've got homework. So this is good. Thank you both for being on the program today. Thank you to our viewing audience as well for joining us here on HealthLink. Please join us again to learn more about programs, services, and resources that are available to you and to your family. Take care. Stay safe. Connect with us by visiting our website or email us at comments at rogerstv.com. With Rogers TV, you can cheer on the home team from the comfort of your living room. We'll head to the rink, the field, the court, or the pitch so you don't have to. Tune in and cheer on your local amateur athletes on Rogers TV. Man, is there a lot of pressure on this young fighter here tonight. Fighting is life. This is my belt, I earned this in blood, paid in full, this is mine. 